So for the last couple of days, we've been doing a little mini-series on the essentials, trying to get back to, the, back to basics uh, when it comes to our faith and to, I suppose, a such a step back. At times, we can be so involved in, in different things that we're doing in the church, different, maybe involved in youth ministry or involved in arranging flowers, involved in promoting Eucharistic adoration, involved in so many things that it's good to actually step back every now and again and say, hold on, where are we going and are we going about it in the best way? You know, because at times we can be so stuck on doing something that we, that we kind of forget the bigger picture, okay? So the, the big picture is that we're called to heaven. And what, what we covered in, in day one there is that there, there is a, a risk, a reality, that we mightn't actually get there. <laughs> uh, basically, that we, we, should, we should have an understanding that going to heaven should not be taken for granted. If we take going to heaven for granted, then you don't do anything about it and you just presume everything will be fine. Very, very, very risky. We wouldn't do that as regards anything else. Right? You wouldn't do that as regards your finances. We'll just invest in some random stocks. I mean, I'll be okay. You know, I mean, you know, we wouldn't be so kind of dismissive about things like that. So the most important thing, eternal salvation, this is worth planning towards. This is worth working towards. Okay? So that was day one. Day two uh, was that we have a guide. So in this mountain that we have to climb we have a guide we're not alone uh we have our lady and she will keep us close to her son who will bring us to the father so that was yesterday the the the, our guide in our lady and our the need to stay close to her to follow her example so today now uh this what we'd like to cover is the idea of not just believing in god right because belief in god is is a really weak idea Right? I believe in God. Like we were doing this in the catechism the other day with our students here. The difference between, you know, I, I believe in Joe and I believe Joe. Right? I believe Joe means I believe what he says. But if someone says, I believe in you, that's not just saying they believe your words, but there's something deeper. I believe in you. You know, I believe in you. I do. I mean, it means I, I believe that within you, there's something more. There's, there's a power, there's an ability, whatever it may be. So belief in God is not, I believe that you exist. That's, that's so weak. It's so, I think it's so far from, from uh, what belief in God should actually mean. Uh, when we look at how Jesus himself, one of the few occasions that Jesus defines eternal life. Okay, Jesus says this, it's John chapter 17, verse 3. He says, Father, this is eternal life. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Interesting. It sounds so simple, really. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God. I think, well, that we all kind of know him, don't we? You'd think. But you see, because like, this isn't a, a, I know you exist, but this is an I know you, I know your heart. Okay, so this is divine intimacy, right? So not just belief in the existence of God, but that, that, that I have an intimate relationship with God. It's a, it's a completely different level altogether. You know, belief in the existence of something. I mean, I, I've used this example before, like, but if some dear husband ever said to his wife, honey, I believe you exist. You could just imagine the, the, the confused look of the wife She'd be kind of waiting for, uh, and, you know, I believe you exist, and you're the most wonderful woman on the face of the planet. Okay, now that, that, that's, okay, that's worth saying. But I believe you exist full stop. What's, what's that even supposed to, what's it supposed, it has no content, like, it, just, it doesn't mean anything. So, I mean, if we say one day, like, you know, I'm pretty proud of myself, I believe God exists, hey, I believe you exist, he'd be like, yep, so what? So what? So what? I mean, if this doesn't affect the way we live, if this doesn't motivate the choices we make, what on earth of a difference does it make? What does it make? What difference does it make? Like None at all. So it's not just to know he exists, but to know him. Divine intimacy. All right? So this is what we're, what we're called to, to try and achieve, to try and live while here on earth. We cover those um, the, the three steps in the spiritual journey, as proposed by the saints, you know, the purgative way, where we try to root out of our lives, uh, sinful tendencies and start to adopt prayer, the illuminative way where this becomes an awful lot deeper, our prayer lives become uh, much more, much deeper, much more intimate. And then there's the unitive way where we live in this constant 
unity with God. You know, so like the standard, the bar is quite high, which is good. It's good that we have a high bar. It's good that we have to, something to strive for, as opposed to just saying, well, sure, I haven't killed anyone. I suppose I'm all right. You know, the bar is high, but that's, that's good. Our Lady, we have Our Lady to guide us. We're called into this divine intimacy, and we are given all the grace we need. Okay? Remember when we were talking about John Paul II uh, in his, his understanding of, of, of the spiritual journey, that God's grace is essential. You don't get there on your own. God's grace is absolutely essential. Part two, part two on the other hand, was that uh, your collaboration is necessary as well. So we need God's grace, yes, but you have to work with it. You have to do something with it. Okay? So we're called to, to enter into a, a, a divine intimacy, an, an intimate relationship with the Lord, that I actually know him. Okay? Uh, a good couple of years ago, a guy named Curtis Martin uh, started a group in Benedictine University over in the States uh, called FOCUS, F-O-C-U-S, the Fellowship of Catholic University Students. And he started with a small group of about 20 students, and he just had this desire, right, to... You can't, you can't teach someone the faith. You can show them... There's a certain amount of information you can, you can communicate. But if you want someone to embrace the faith, they're embracing a relationship, so you can't teach that you can just show what it looks like and hope that the others will, will follow. You know, you can't, you can't force someone to believe, but you can show what belief looks like. You can show what following the Lord looks like. So that's what he tried to do with these university students, just live the faith, to have a, a divine intimacy himself and then to invest in sincere friendship, authentic friendship uh, with the students, that, that you know them, you care about them. And then you equip them to form others. So these were his, his three habits of a missionary, which actually outlines in this book here, Making Missionary Disciples by Curtis Martin. Um, very, very simple book, but fantastic. There's great practical wisdom there. But he says, if we're going to be missionary, and when Lord knows the church is, 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 needs to be missionary at the moment, if we're going to be missionary, it starts with us having divine intimacy first. Because I cannot give what I haven't got. And any initiative any initiative you start, if it's not rooted in divine intimacy or in those ministering, having divine intimacy, it's not going to go anywhere. It can't. How can it? Where do you hope to go? So these were his three habits of a, a successful missionary. One, that they have divine intimacy. Two, that they have authentic friendship with other people, that you invest in people. It's not about numbers. It's not about converting the whole world. It's about trying to help those in your immediate circle to come to know and love the Lord better. And then thirdly, in time, to equip them to do the same to others, to equip those you mission to, to mission to others. So, like, it's just... That was... I don't know how long ago that was. It was about 20 years ago-ish, maybe. Maybe the, the, the turn of the millennium. Uh, and he had about 20 students there in Benedictine University. And last year I went to seek to the Focus Conference over in Indiana, and there were... 17,000 university students gathered for a conference. The, the place, I mean, you've, if you've ever been to the RDS, the RDS, when it's full, holds about 5,500, I think. So it was four times that. The auditorium was enormous. We were processing in. It was like walking two lengths of Croke Park. You know, you're just, are we still processing? <laughs> and, 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 and university students, like 18 to 23 or 4, the, the most difficult age to get to practice, right? The place absolutely jam-packed with them. It works. You know, it's divine intimacy, authentic friendship, and equipping them to, to form others. It works. But it starts with divine intimacy. M me having divine intimacy. And to that end, we have the guidance of our Blessed Lady. In order, to, in order for this to happen, uh, there are one or two prunings that may need to happen in our lives. This is the bit we don't like. Uh, and St. Augustine very famously said, grant me chastity and continence, but not yet. I was afraid you might hear my prayer quickly and that you might too rapidly heal me of the disease of lust, which I preferred to satisfy rather than suppress. You know, so give me chastity, but just, just, just not now if that's okay. <laughs> you know, so there are things that we, we'd like to root out of our lives 
Or maybe we just kind of rather see other people root their sin out. Yeah, they should. They should. Them communists, they should stop being communists. And then their, them their murderers, they should stop murdering, for God's sake. And then their druggies, what are they at? What are they at? Stop, stop the drugs, right? And it's very, very easy to tell everyone how, how they should convert, right? Uh, that's easy. But divine, if I'm going to have divine intimacy, in order, if I'm going to have room in my heart for God, then I have to root out what shouldn't be there. Whatever it may be, whatever vice it is, whatever uh, sin it is, whatever pride, arrogance, lust, avarice, whatever it may be, whatever it may be. And to that end, St. Francis de Sales gives us great advice, um, something which I, I, I found very, very helpful, uh, also from a, a, a confessional perspective, where people come and they keep falling into the same sin. And they say, you know, Father, just, I'm trying, you know, I fell into that particular sin again. And what's interesting is, if you try to identify, not, not just, just the sin itself, which is important to understand and identify, but what happened just before the sin? Did that sin tend to happen always with the same people? Or, always, like, you know, if it's always with a certain friend that you drink too much? Okay, so how are we going to avoid the sin in the future? It should be fairly straightforward. <laughs> You know, if you always get drunk with that friend on a Saturday night, then if you don't go out with that friend on a Saturday night, the chances are you won't get drunk. There you are. So are you serious about sobriety or not? Uh, if with your girlfriend, you know, things get a bit, go a bit too far, than, uh, further than they should, and it always happens in a certain place or on a certain night or in a certain, if late at night you stay over, well, then chances are if you don't stay over, it's not going to happen. So again, are you serious about about rooting the sin out or not. And St. Francis de Sales, an absolute genius, like uh, when he, he talks about sin, and he says the, he identifies the three steps in the process of temptation. So firstly, the sin is proposed. Like even the last couple of days, um, <clears throat> apparently from the Vatican, um, on the Pope's, what is it, Instagram page, Twitter page, whatever it is, he liked an image of some Brazilian model sort of thing. Uh, all right, so you, like this, this came up in my news feed because it's about the Pope, <laughs> right? So then like, okay, the sin is proposed, right? You see a little portion of the image. What image was he looking at? <laughs> so the sin is proposed. Should I look and see what, see what he was, see, was, is it appropriate or not? Sin is proposed, right? <clears throat> then we're either pleased or displeased at the temptation because without even falling into it, you go, oh, thank God I've been tempted. Well, maybe you shouldn't say praise it that way, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad, oh, here we go. I'm, I'm presented a temptation. It wasn't my fault. I didn't go looking for it. It just landed on my phone. Okay, so now you can either take pleasure or displeasure in it. Say, oh my goodness, get that off. You know, don't like story, not interested. Uh, or you can have a flick on through and just see how. So you can either be pleased or displeased. So the temptation is presented. You're pleased or displeased. And then you either consent or reject. <clears throat> and another thing that he outlines, which I found again very helpful, <clears throat> was that in order to renounce sin, you have to renounce also just the pleasure of the thought of the sin. You know, so you haven't actually sinned yet, but you can take pleasure in, in the thought of sinning or take pleasure in previous sins. So again, you, you haven't fallen into this particular sin yet, but you're leaving the door wide open. And, and if we don't close those kind of doors, then we're constantly, while on one hand striving for divine intimacy, we're going to have this lead weight around our ankles dragging us back all the time. So it's not just to, to avoid sin, but avoid the near occasions of sin. Not just to avoid sin, but avoid the pleasure of the thought of sin. Not just to avoid sin, but avoid the pleasure of the memory of previous sins. That's why also here in community, and also in the Tenacular community and different things like that, um, they never talk about their previous lives and, oh, I remember I got so drunk, lad, and we got arrested. And we, you know, we never tell stories like that, because... It's, we shouldn't be boasting about how, how bad we were before we converted, you know, because it also it stirs up imaginations and fascinations in other people. So not just to cut ties with sin, but cut ties with the very thought of sin. So in this effort and this goal and this challenge to get to heaven and this uh, epic story, which we're part of, this, this most cosmic drama of salvation. Little me, little you, we're, we're all involved. And we have the attention of God the Father. We have his heart already. His heart has been given to us. Jesus 
in his humanity has poured out his heart, divine love upon each one of us. So in the grace available to us in the sacraments, we lack nothing. So yes, this, this, is, this is a challenge, especially in such a, a sinful world. It's so hard to remain pure and, and prayerful, untarnished by everything that surrounds us. But we have God on our side. We have everything we need. And as we remembered yesterday from John's Gospel, we take solace in the words of Jesus, who says, I have told you these things, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. Amen.